So I just want to say good morning and thank you for joining us. This webinar will be discussing wealth wisdom and powered financial strategies for retirement with our guest, financial planner, Alex Selesnev with Capital Squared Financial, Financial and real estate expert, Jan Brito with Capital Senior Solutions. I'm Angelique Jackson and I'm the business development and marketing manager at Charles E. Smith Life Communities. And our organization takes pride in providing personalized experiences tailored to the unique needs of older adults. No matter what stage of life they're in, we offer a variety of services, including independent living at Ring House, affordable independent living at Revit's House, assisted, and memory, assisted living and memory care at Landau and Cohen Rosen House, post-acute and long-term care at the Hebrew Home of Greater Washington, primary care at Hirsch Health Center, and Elder Safe Center, the first program of its kind in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area to provide community education, advocacy, and safe temporary shelter to older adults who are experiencing abuse. So if you are interested in learning more about our residences and our services, please visit our website or give us a call at the Welcome Center to schedule a tour. Our contact information will be shared in the chat section, so please um, feel free to add all of your questions to the chat. We look forward to addressing that. And so just a few reminders before we begin, um, we are recording this webinar, so please, if you can make sure that you're muted, um, just so that our other attendees um, can hear so there won't be any issues. And so I will now turn it over to Alex and Jan. Again, thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, we've had a, a great um, a couple of series to discuss topics like these, and um, I really appreciate their time. So take it away. <laughs> thank you, Angelique. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Brito. I am with Capital Senior Solutions. And as Angelique mentioned, I am a residential realtor. And you may be wondering, why the heck is a realtor participating in a webinar on financial planning? Well, if you go to the next slide, um, I tell you a little bit about my background. I've been specializing in working with older adults through late in life move transitions since 2020. I've been licensed for 19 years, but I've, I think I've found my passion with this particular niche, if you will. Um, as I grew older and my client base grew older, I saw a need for a higher level of education to better serve folks going through these late in life transitions because it's so much more involved than a, a traditional move. I mean, moving is stressful at any age, but especially when you're older. And so I uh, sought out uh, some education from an organization known as the Seniors Real Estate Institute based in Oklahoma. And it, uh, it was a graduate level course, I would equate it to. It took about a year to get through it. And as a result, I was designated as a certified senior housing specialist. And there are only about 160 of us in, in the country. So we sorely need more. With over 10,000 people turning 65 every day, there's a need for more realtors that are skilled in working with this demographic. I then went on to get certified as a senior downsizing coach because this is a very emotional process. And sometimes you might think about moving but then you take two steps back and you go, I'm not ready. And so I can help people, uh, coach people through that process. So one of the main focuses, other than selling a home when that time comes, of Capital Senior Solutions is education. I provide uh, monthly seminars on various topics of interest, believe it or not, not real estate, uh, but things like financial planning and the things that you should be thinking about pre and post retirement and documents that you might need and what's important at that stage in your life. So that is why today I am proud to be partnering with Alex Selesnev of Capital Squared Financial, who is a wonderful financial planner who specializes in pre and post retirement, and he's really smart. So I will thank go ahead you. and turn it over to Alex now. Well, and let thank him introduce you. Himself further. <laughs> thank you, Jan. I, I very much appreciate that, and uh, I appreciate our collaboration. Um, and I'll start with Angelique. Actually, thanks so much for organizing this i was just thinking about this is probably the fourth maybe the fifth event we would do with you and hopefully there'll be many more 
And with you, Jan, I think we've done maybe a good dozen of them or more. Yeah. And again, like like you said, on different topics. So, and I'm sure we're going to do even more in the future. Yeah, we've um, been doing monthly seminars for Ringhouse since 2022 or three. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. So thank yeah. you, Angelique, for your partnership. No, thank you for yours. I appreciate <laughs> you know, your willingness to share your time and expertise to discuss these topics. Of course. So our seminar today, you know, Wealth Wisdom, Empowered Financial Strategies for Retirement. We'll talk about different things um, that will hopefully be relevant to those who are either transitioning or already in retirement. That is really the focus of our webinar today. Uh, before we get started, I will you know, introduce myself. So again, my name is Alex, Alex Selesnev. I'm the founder and president of Capital Squared Financial. Uh, we're a local firm in Rockville, Maryland, and we specialize in retirement planning. And when I say we specialize in retirement planning, that is you know, all we do. We work with people who are thinking about transitioning or, of course, in retirement. The average age of our, of our clients is actually 63. Um, in terms of my background, I'm a certified financial planner. I'm a, a certified financial analyst, so that's more of an investment designation. And prior to launching Capital Squared, I used to be a partner at a regional CPA firm. So I've been I've been doing a lot of tax planning work. And some sense, you know, when people ask me, well, why 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 would you focus on retirement planning specifically? Why not something else? Well, in reality, again, for people who are perhaps you know, in the accumulation stage of their lives, you know, their situation can be, you know, complex, but certainly not as complex as someone who is already transitioning or again in retirement. And as we'll discuss today, there are so many different issues that need to need, need to be, you know, discussed. And that is again my background. Uh, in terms of our approach, we always serve as a fiduciary when we work with our clients. And perhaps for those of you who are you know, less familiar with the term. Now, any advice that we provided has to be in your best interest. And from our perspective, again, our only source of revenue is what we, you know, the payments we receive from our clients directly. So we don't sell any products. So there is really no issue from that perspective. Uh, if you want to learn more, of course, feel free to reach out, um, you know, af after the seminar or of course, feel free to visit our website. Uh, so the first slide here, just to kind of get us started here. Um, how important is it for, you know, for us to collaborate with other professionals when we develop someone's comprehensive financial plan? And again, when we, you know, co-present with other professionals, this is usually our starting, you know, discussion point. In short, this is extremely important. I'll, I'll just say that. In fact, in, in my role, you know, one of the um, ways to describe what I do, I'm a financial quarterback. That's how people sometimes refer to, to someone in my position. So we coordinate, of course, with real estate professionals such as GM. We work with estate planners who, in our case, specifically you know, specialize in elder law. We do work with different insurance specialists, you know, long-term care insurance as an example, or other types of insurance. CPAs goes without saying. We work with them all the time. And I mean, again, I probably spend a good quarter of my time, as I think about it, you know, collaborating with other professionals. Jan, anything you would want to add here? No, I, I think that's, uh, uh, you've covered it all. Uh, working, your, your professional advisors working together hand in hand is, is, uh, is really imperative to, so that you, they get a holistic picture of what you're dealing with. And it's most helpful when they all communicate together. Absolutely. And entirely agreed. Yeah. Uh, so, you no, know, another concern, and this, you know, comes up very frequently one way or the other in our, you know, initial client meetings or, you know, somewhere in the middle of, of the relationship. Well, what happens if something goes wrong with my account? And again, when, when I discuss this and perhaps Jan will add her comments, from our perspective, we're mostly talking about their clients' investment or bank accounts. So that's really what I what I would be referring to. So in terms of what protections are there for the clients, well, there's a variety of different things. So our you know relationship is with Schwab Institutional, 
and I'm sure many people, you know, heard of Schwab. They're one of the largest, you know, custodians in the nation, probably in the, in the world, actually. And they have the state of the art system, of course, to protect their clients' assets. But I'll just point out a couple of things. Anytime we deal specifically with cash transfers or wires, right? When someone is trying to, let's say, buy a house and they're wiring funds somewhere else, we're required to get a verbal confirmation. So if someone sends us an email and says, Alex, please send, you know, $300,000 to this escrow account, you know, we're just not going to do that. We're going to pick up the phone, call the client and ask, and ask this question. So that's one. In terms of accessing your, you know, account information, perhaps with some of you heard of the two-way authentication, you do need a smartphone for that. And essentially what happens when you go, let's say on Schwab's website, you enter your login, you enter your password, and then they send you a code to your phone, to the phone number and file that you need to enter to access your account. That by itself prevents so many, you know, potential issues because yes, perhaps some people will, you know, find out what your login and password is. And as um, some of us know, you know, we tend to use exactly the same password all over the place. That's actually a common problem. So the two-way authentication really helps with that. And then finally, again, this is specific to our firm's process. Anytime we deal with cash transfer specifically, we set up a so-called money link. You know, perhaps they call it differently at different financial institutions. And by having you know, the so-called money link in place, we're only allowed to transfer cash in and out of the account um, that we have on file. So if it's your, let's say, Bank of America account, that's the only place where the funds can be going to. If you want to transfer to some other account, we can create another form. But again, that, that creates that protection. Uh, so how do you keep your clients' information secure? That's Again, that's a big, big question, big issue. And I'll tell you what a couple of weeks ago I was um, meeting with a very good friend of mine. I haven't seen him for five years or so. He is in cybersecurity. So of course we you know, caught up and everything, but we had to talk business a little bit. That does come out you know, naturally. So he was in some sense updating me on all the different threats that are out there. And I'll tell you again, I'm not trying to you know, scare anyone by any means, but there are a lot of issues that many people are not even aware of when it comes to cybersecurity. So on our end, again, what do we do to, um, to keep everything secure? We have a client portal and we encourage our clients to use it. You know, we'll create it for you. You upload your documents to the portal. We can, we can do the same. If that's not appropriate for any reason, we at the very least protect our clients' you know, documents and we don't use their social security numbers. And that's a very common way of password protecting them. Believe it or not, a lot of people are aware of your social security number. Again, I'm not going to go in detail, but that's, you know, I don't want to say it's public information, but a lot of people know it. Um, now, the, the other piece, and I will point that out, there's the cybersecurity hygiene. Make sure that on your end, things are secure. Like every so often, people use their computer for a variety of different things, of course, including their financial information. So that can potentially create issues. Jan, any? Yes, I did want here? to add something to that. Um, I wanted to reassure everyone that while your professional advisors work hand in hand, your information is still kept confidential. For instance, I have no need to have the level of uh, information that Alex has on your personal financial situation. Happy to connect you. Um, another example is if you're purchasing a home and you're working with a, a lender at a mortgage company, um, I will be involved with that lender, but that lender only needs to share with me that your credit score is good enough to get the loan and that you have, that they have verified that you have the cash to do the transaction to, to have for the down payment and the closing costs. Um, they don't share your personal information with me. Never do I need your social security number ever. I don't want that. And the other thing I will say about a real estate transaction and, and secure information is that um, typically buyers these days will wire their money into the settlement company for the closing. And, and that could include moving into a senior community when you have a large uh, entry fee that you need to wire. You will receive wire instructions from that entity or that title company giving you their account number for their wire uh, receiving. 
Um, never blindly follow those instructions. Pick up the phone and call the person whose number you have that you believe sent it. Don't call the number on the email that you get and confirm that it's authentic because scammers are out there taking hundreds of thousands of dollars away from consumers. So it's very important to be careful about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I mean, that is that is just so true. One final comment I'll make before we move on, specifically for, for our client base, anytime I work with someone who is uncomfortable, they're just uncomfortable with electronic you know, document transfers, well, just drop them off in our office. It can be as simple as that. In some sense, you can really eliminate you know, a lot of these potential dangers by you know, dealing with paper documents. So that option is still is still available. Uh, so Jan, this this slide is perhaps for you if yes. you want to cover it. Yes, one very important uh, factor when you're selling property in Maryland that a lot of people are unaware of is that if you own a home in the state of Maryland and maybe you have a second home in Florida or Arizona where you stay during the winter, and as you think about retiring and selling your home in Maryland, you think, well, let me go ahead and change my address to my Florida house because that's where I'm going to live in retirement. If you sell your Maryland home after having changed your state of residence from Maryland, you could be subject to an 8% Maryland non-resident withholding tax on your profit. Now, granted, you will be exempt from some capital gains taxes with the exclusions that are available. For instance, $250,000 for a single person and $500,000 for a married couple but you could be subject to this additional 8% tax, which could really be painful. So it's very important to check with your tax accountant before you change your address from the state of Maryland if you are thinking of selling your home. Um, just, just words of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Okay, so what is comprehensive financial planning? What does it entail? So of course, depending on who is you know, presenting this information to you, you'll get a slightly different answer, but at least the way we see it, you know, the process of creating a comprehensive financial plan is essentially you know, you're creating a roadmap for someone that tells them specifically how they'll be accomplishing their you know, financial goals in this case. As an example, well, how much do you need to save to be comfortable in retirement? That is perhaps one of the most common questions exactly how would you be saving the money in your brokerage account, in your traditional 401k? Should you have a Roth IRA? Uh, once someone gets closer to their retirement age, exactly how would you be claiming your social security benefits, specifically at what age? If you're married, when we're dealing with couples, there are multiple strategies that can be implemented to actually increase their lifetime benefits. Of course, different tax minimization strategies, they're always part of a truly comprehensive financial plan. So again, the idea is to really create a roadmap that you can follow, periodically review, and most importantly, implement. And we'll, we'll certainly talk about certain parts of a comprehensive financial plan today. So in terms of the you know, again, agenda, and as I as I mentioned earlier, today we'll, we'll be focusing uh, mostly on, on those who are perhaps, you know, transitioning or already in retirement. That's, that's the idea for the seminar today. We'll talk about the three issues to consider post-retirement. I'll actually start with that. We'll talk about different gifting strategies. That is actually one of the top questions I get, usually closer to, to the end of the year when, you know, our clients want to gift money to, to their children, grandchildren, or they want to support their charities. And you know, we'll certainly talk about different investment strategies, or actually, I should say, one investment approach to keep your um, investments safe in retirement. So in terms of the top you know, issues to consider, and this is, again, incredibly common. This is perhaps one of the top issues I see when I work with you know, my new clients. Now, are you investing too conservatively? So there is this cliche idea, and yes, I'll use that word, that you know, as people get closer to their retirement, they automatically need to invest more conservatively. Now, in practice, or I should say on average, perhaps there is some truth behind that. That's understandable. But the question then becomes, how conservatively? One of the things I like to point out when we have those conversations, and let's say someone is you know, 65 years old, I would say, well, look, 
you're retiring, let's say this year, but we still need to cover, you know, 30 sometimes plus years for you in retirement. So when you're investing too conservatively, well, that really, that significantly increases your chances of actually uh, outliving your money. So here's, you know, an example of someone we actually um, met with. This is, this was last year, but again, it's a very common situation. So Susan, which is not her real name, of course, um, she was single, recently retired. She received an inheritance. So there was a, you know, cash infusion on her end. And um, she was actually at the time really concerned about the markets. So she reached out to us um, for an investment review. So after you know, spending actually not, not too much time, it was pretty apparent what was happening. Well, she maintained large amounts in cash. Again, we're not talking about money markets. We're not talking about bonds. We're just talking about cash, cash. And in some sense, it's a good problem to have but it's not earning you much. Uh, she, in terms of her investment, invested accounts, I should say, they were mostly in bond funds, again, ultra conservative. Um, and one of the things she pointed out, again, that's in some sense what triggered the review, she, she noticed that the value, values of her accounts, they have not been trending up, even though, you know, even at the time, the markets were rather strong. I asked her, you know, do you have a, plan in place. And, you know, we, she shared some, some ideas with me, but again, it was clear that there was no written plan in place. And that is sometimes one of, also one of the primary concerns when people are transitioning into the next chapter of their life, they're you know ready to enjoy their golden years, but there's really no plan in place, just, you know, just their thoughts essentially. So as part of our, you know, process, this was um, this is what we actually discussed in the planning meeting. So, you know, sometimes people misunderstand, I'll, I'll put it that way, um, you know, the, the value of essentially accumulating, accumulating your assets or specifically the value of growth in your account. So as an example, let's say you start with, you know, $100,000, which is, you know, a sizable sum. And let's say you invest the funds conservatively. So as you can see here, you know, on the bottom, I know it's perhaps a little small, you invest in 30% stocks and 70% bonds. Let's say that's a conservative allocation. Now, in comparison, if as part of your you know, retirement plan, you decide to invest in more of a balanced allocation, which is usually considered to be um, 60% and 40%, 60% uh, stocks and 40% bonds. Well, over time, the difference is actually $72,000. So this may or may not be all that significant, again, over someone's retirement, that is for you to decide. Now, when we work with larger accounts, so specifically, let's say this is a million dollar account, well, that difference, and it's exactly the same, you know, mathematically, it can be dramatic. You know, in this case, we're talking about $721,000 over, let's say, your retirement period here. And this is a 20 year period. As you can imagine, it would be even more than that if we're talking about 30 years. Of course, what is it that you can do with the money? Well, perhaps it would give you that additional safety in retirement. Perhaps as we'll discuss later today, you would want to support your you know, children, grandchildren or your charities. So you'd have some additional funds. What if you have some you know, long-term care expenses later in your retirement that should pretty much always be this course discussed as someone's as part of someone's retirement plan. Again, the idea is to not invest too conservatively early in your retirement. And we'll, we'll talk about how specifically you would do that in a moment. So the question again, you know, will you outlive your funds? Um, the starting point for this conversation is to really plan to be in retirement to age 95. That is, that is our go-to at this point. And of course, we'll adjust it based on our client's specific circumstances. Um, in terms of the market volatility, in terms of market turbulence, um, even though we haven't experienced much of it over the past you know, 18 months or so, but please realize this is a short-term issue. And it truly is, there's a lot of you know, research behind that. In the long run, you know, the biggest concern should really be inflation and you know, the so-called longevity risk, meaning that you're essentially run out of money in retirement. So how do you, you know, make sure that this doesn't happen? Well, again, one of the best ways to do so 
is to have a written plan in place. It doesn't have to be complex. It can, so in many cases, easily fit on a single sheet of paper, but it needs to be in place. And you want to stress test it for different contingencies. As an example, and again, specifically for those who are young retirees, what happens if the markets are down by 30%, you know, just like it happened in 2020, in the year of your retirement? Exactly how would you cover you know, your portfolio distributions? All of that really needs to be addressed as part of the plan. So here's how we would do it. And this is, again, a specific example for you know, Susan. Um, been working with her for what, almost two years at this point. So portfolio value of 800,000. She is risk averse, above average life expectancy. So both of her parents, um, they actually lived with beyond their age 90, if I, if I remember correctly. So our step one to, was to determine her actual you know, portfolio cash needs. So we determined that she needs $7,000 to maintain her lifestyle in retirement. Um, Susan is a former government employee, so she also had a pension and social security income, which you know, greatly helps, of course, and that was roughly $3,000 net of taxes. So each month, essentially, she needs $4,000 from her portfolio, and over time, of course, we need to adjust it for inflation. So we determined that, and that was part of the planning process. Step two is to determine how much you need to maintain in so-called bond buffer. And I hope that's not too, too much of a technical term, but that is, again, your, that's the protection mechanism that you need to put in place. It's not that complex, actually. $4,000 a month multiplied by 12 you know, to annualize it. Multiplied by seven gives us $336,000 in bonds is how much we would you know, recommend that she keeps in those types of investments. Why seven years? I usually get this question. Why seven specifically? This happens to be this average business cycle in the US. So for, for it takes approximately seven years for the markets to go from the top to the bottom and then back to the top. And we want all of our clients who are again considering or already in retirement to have at least seven years, you know, in this so-called bond buffer for protection purposes. So then you do, again, a pretty simple math. You take 336,000, you divide it by her portfolio value. That gives us 42%. And that is our suggested allocation for Susan. So 42% bonds and 58% in stocks. Now, there are other adjustments that we can discuss. Again, I don't want to make it too technical here. You now, how much, how much your portfolio can generate in dividend income, you know, depending on the size of your portfolio. Um, you know, there are other considerations too, but again, the idea is to ensure that you have at least seven years of your projected portfolio cash needs in something liquid and readily available. That is, again, one of the core ideas um, of, of your retirement plan. Okay, so the next issue, again, talking about three issues post-retirement, what happens very frequently when I meet, again, with my new clients, and that either comes up in the first meeting or sometimes in the second meeting, but they either don't have any estate plan, estate planning done for, for some time for the past, you know, 10 or 20 years, or they, or they don't even have it to begin with. That, you know, goes without saying is a big, big concern. So, um, you know, without not a licensed attorney. So of course, if you ever decide to update or create, you know, your, your own estate plan, you should talk with someone and we can of course provide referrals, but this is just something for you to keep in mind. So I'll start with perhaps one of the most basic documents, it's your will. Well, everyone should have one, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your age, regardless, you know, if you're thinking about retirement or not, you need to have that in place. If you die without a will, essentially the state would be making those decisions for you in terms of what, what happens to your property. And it's, it's not pretty, you know, the idea of having probate will likely be pricey. It will take, you know, some time. You really don't want uh, that to happen. Now, the next step, now, do you need to have a living or revocable trust? I usually refer to it as a revocable trust, meaning that you can um, change it at any time. You can change the terms of the trust at any time. Do you need to have one? 
Well, it really depends on your needs. I don't necessarily think that everyone needs to have it, but I would say many people would benefit from it. So what are some of the benefits? Well, any assets that are titled into, into, your, um, into your trust, they avoid probate. And again, this can be a costly process. And if you can do it you know, during your lifetime in an orderly fashion, that will save you and your family a lot of time and money. Um, now, a probate is a public process, just so everyone knows. Um, now, if your documents, if your assets, I should say, are you know are transferred to someone else as part of your trust, that is a private process. That's very important for because for many people, and specifically for those who have multiple properties or have significant assets, that is one of the primary concerns. They want to keep things private. The other benefit, which is perhaps you know, less known, but when you designate a trustee, um, as part of the process, well, he or she would be able to manage your assets if you're become incapacitated for any reasons. Um, you can usually accomplish that a different way. We'll talk about the um, um, powers of attorney in just a moment, but that can be done um, as part of the um, trust creation process. Power of attorney, you no know, financial and health. Um, and these documents, by the way, they would usually be created for you as part of a um, regular estate planning engagement, usually they would propose to create these documents for you. In terms of the financial POA, as I mentioned earlier, you would want to designate someone who would act on your behalf if you become incapacitated. Now, I'll tell you this, in my line of work, I deal with specifically financial POAs very frequently, almost every month or so, because what happens, you know, as people age, right? Their children, usually they want to help them with their finances specifically. They reach out to someone like myself. And I would normally say, well, you know what? I've been working with your mother for the past 10 years. I know you want to help, but we really need to have this document in place because otherwise I wouldn't be able to actually accept your instructions. You know, we, we usually, you know, flexible about that. But when you're making a decision on someone else's um, on someone else's behalf, essentially, you need to have that document in place. Same goes for medical, but that's more of a sensitive issue. Um, I usually don't focus on that too much. Keep in mind the so-called transfer and death accounts. Um, again, depending on your specific circumstances, this is a very convenient way to transfer assets to someone else. Um, usually it works well for smaller accounts. Let's say you, know, you want someone to have access um, for, for some funds for any immediate expenses. So you can desi designate your account as a TOD account. So it goes directly to the intended beneficiary. So when should you revisit your estate plan? Well, depending again on who you speak with, some people will tell you every couple of years, every three years, every four. I would say a good rule of thumb is to revisit every seven years or when your circumstances change. I mean, as an example, if you move from Maryland to Virginia, or you know, you move to some other state, usually that triggers that. Uh, now it's important to, to periodically review your beneficiary designations. This, by the way, you know, yes, my experience, I've been involved in situations like this where it created a lot of issues, you know, post-divorce, right? People get divorced, they have sizable, let's say, IRA accounts, they forget to change the beneficiary to someone else besides their ex-spouse and something happens, creates, as you can imagine, significant issues. So, you know, make sure that you periodically review that. Uh, now, if you have any specific charitable intents, that's again, happens in my line of work when people want to leave, let's say they look at their accounts, they need to have X, you know, to comfortably retire, given the market uh, performance results that X becomes larger and larger. So they really want to leave a portion of their, you know, assets to different charities. Uh, so that would be a good example of when you want to revisit your state planning documents. Uh, now, adjust to, to the SECURE Act provisions. I'll actually skip talking about that. That's more of a technical issue. But as part of the original SECURE Act, you know, 1.0, it actually changed things somewhat from the state planning perspective. But again, I'll, I would rather skip talking about that today. All right, so moving on, 
again, what are the top mistakes to avoid? Procrastination. <laughs> that is uh, one of the top issues when it comes to estate planning or you know, even financial planning in general. This is not what people necessarily want to think about or talk about, but then you know, things happen, unfortunately, and they're unprepared. I talked about beneficiary designations. That is something that each of you can easily do pretty much today. All you, all you have to do is log in um, um, to, you know, to your, into your account, you know, IRA, 401k account, or Roth IRA, and check the beneficiary, make sure it matches your preferences. Uh, now, life insurance, that's, that's the separate issue. Some people, they don't think about it as part of their estate. And that actually happened with, with one of my um, engagements. So we talked about this person's house, retirement accounts, and everything else. And then he forgot to mention that it had a sizable life insurance policy. And I'm, I'm glad we actually caught this on time. And that was done as part of his estate planning process because, you know, well, upon your death, you know, your, your life insurance in most cases would be part of your estate. And if it's above a certain amount, it's, you know, 5 million in Maryland, it's 4.7 million in DC. Actually, if it's above that threshold, well, there would be some estate tax to pay. So you have to be careful with that. The other issue specifically for revocable trust is when people you know, create those documents, everything is in place, exactly how they want things to happen, but then they fail to retitle their accounts into the trust. As a result of that, and yes, I mean it exactly the way I'm about to say it, the trust document is worthless. You have to retitle your accounts into the trust in order for it to, to work the, the, the way you wanted it to work essentially. Okay, so moving on. And again, if, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll address them, um, address them as we go. So gifting, yeah, this is, this is something I frequently discuss with, with my clients. They reach out to me and they say, I want to support my grandchild or I want to support my fav favorite charity. What is the best way you know, to do that? Uh, so cash gifts, cash gifts or donations. Well, this is of course the easiest way to help. And usually I would say if you work with, if you deal with many you know, small gifts or many um, charitable donations of a you know, smaller amount, this is usually the best way to go. Keep track of your contributions or keep track of your gifts um, in a single spreadsheet. And that's really all you need to do. No need to complicate your life. Anytime you deal with larger gifts, and it's you know for you to decide exactly what that means, but I would say usually we're talking you know thousands of dollars. Um, there are other ways to keep it more tax efficient to potentially help you save some in taxes. Now, I'll, I'll tell you up front, this does require more planning or at the very least understanding how it works because otherwise you know you would you would potentially make mistakes now in terms of the annual gift uh, filing exclusion you know sometimes people refer to it as an annual gift tax exclusion which is perhaps not the best way of describing it but essentially it's $18,000 per person in 2024 and all that means that in 2024 you can gift you know up to $18,000 to any person doesn't have to be your relative. It can be any anyone without a need to file a gift tax return. If you gift more, you would need to file a gift tax return. That's not a problem. In most cases, it would simply reduce your lifetime exemption. Usually you would want to avoid that. But again, in practice, in many cases, that is not a big issue. Okay, so stock gifts. And again, in this case, we're talking about um, gifting to, let's say, your grandchild. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, there are multiple reasons. Perhaps you would want your grandchildren, again, to have this investment education. You want them to be more involved, um, or perhaps your grandchild, which is frequently the case, is in a lower tax bracket. So here's an example of how this would work. We have Judy, our grandmother here. Uh, she's in a 25% tax bracket. If she sells you know, $1,000, stock, let's say that's the value of the stock. Um, let's say it accumulated $700 of you know, capital gains. She would have to pay taxes, you know, 25% essentially. So 
if she sells and decides to gift, you know, after she pays taxes, it would be only $825. If she gifts the actual appreciated stock to her son or to her grandson, you know, Eric, who's let's say recently graduated and he finds himself in the 0% tax bracket. And then if Eric sells the same stock, he would just walk away with a thousand dollars. He wouldn't have to pay any taxes. Again, you would have to, you know, analyze the situation, spend a little bit of time on this. And as you can imagine, if we start talking about larger gifts, you know, your tax savings can be much more significant than, you know, a few hundred dollars in this example. Uh, stock donations. In some sense, it's a similar concept here. So let's say you want to support, you know, the United Way as an example, right? So what if, let's say, Raymond here wants to gift, you know, $5,000 to them? So same thing. If he sells $5,000 worth of stock, he would most likely have to pay capital gain taxes if that stock, again, appreciated, um, you know, significantly in our example over the past number of years. Or the next option is for him to simply donate the stock directly to his favorite charity, because again, the charities there, um, they don't pay any taxes to begin with, so they don't really care what type of property you give them. So he wouldn't pay any taxes, or Raymond wouldn't pay any taxes, but he would get a tax deduction. So in some sense, there's this double benefit of not paying any taxes and also receiving a tax deduction can be more complex than that because now we start talking about itemized deductions. So this doesn't necessarily work this nicely for everyone. But again, this is one of the options to consider. Qualified charitable distributions. So this is perhaps one of the best ways for you know, retirees. And in most cases, we are talking about retirees here um, um, to save, um, save taxes when they have you know, certain charitable intent. So here's how it works. At the age of 73, this under the Secure Act 2.0, you're actually required to take a certain amount out of your um, retirement accounts um, each year. So so-called required minimum distribution. Now, a portion of your required minimum distribution, specifically up to 100,000, can be donated directly to a qualified charity. Now, why would you want to take your approach? Well, the answer to that question is actually rather simple. Any portion that you gift, uh, or, or, or I should say direct to a qualified charity of, of your RMD entirely bypasses your tax return. So here's John here. John is you know, very happy because he learned about the strategy. So John has an, our requirement minimum distribution of $30,000 this year. And let's say he's in a 24% tax bracket. Now, if he decides to transfer $20,000 of his RMD to different charities, it can be as many as you want, actually, his tax savings would be, in this example, almost $5,000 because he wouldn't have to pay any taxes on the amounts that he directs to different charities. This can be incredibly powerful. And of course, we're working on the assumption that you have that charitable intent because otherwise perhaps you, you would just you know, pay taxes and keep the money. But if that's the case, this is one of the most um, tax efficient strategies out there. Okay, and then finally, in terms of the donor advised funds, um, I can imagine how, again, perhaps some of you are familiar, but I'll, I'll start with the basics here. These work very well when the markets are strong, just like they were last year, um, in 2023 and you know so far this year the markets have been very strong so the idea here is to create again a so-called DAF or donor advised fund which is not a complex process you can do it at essentially any um, brokerage company out there and then to transfer appreciated stock right so don't you don't have to pay any capital gains taxes on that you would get a tax deduction on the transfer of the appreciated stock in the year of the transfer, so let's say in 2024, but then it's for you to decide exactly when and what charity receives the money, okay? Even better, to make this even, even, even a better deal, the funds can still be invested, so over time, perhaps they, they will continue to grow. So here's Marilyn here. Let's say she wants to gift 
$5,000 to different charities each year. And let's say we'll look at her tax situation and we determine that if she does exactly that, there is no tax benefit. Now, what she can do though, if she has the money, if she has the means to do so, she can transfer $30,000 of appreciated stock into her donor advice fund or DAF. She would then receive a $30,000 tax deduction in the year of transfer. So that would you know, most likely significantly lower her taxes. And then over the next, what would this be several years essentially, she would continue to transfer $5,000 worth of stock, it actually would be, would be in cash to her different charities. So you see from, from the charitable perspective, she accomplishes exactly the same thing, right? But when you look at it from her overall tax perspective, it can be significantly more beneficial for her to do that um, through a DAF. Okay, so one of the questions that frequently comes up when we do this specific you know, seminar so when you are considering liquidating your assets, what should you sell first, right? You're trying to buy a home, you're trying to finance some other, you know, large purchase. Well, my answer to that question is actually, it, it, it depends, That's really my answer. A typical approach is to start with your brokerage accounts first or with your taxable accounts first. And the reason you would want to do that is because, you know, if your funds accumulated, um, you know, capital gains, you would be paying taxes at a long-term capital gains tax rate in most cases, which is much lower than your you know, ordinary income tax rate. The next best option is to take some funds out of your IRA or your 401k account or so-called pre-tax account. And then, and only then, you would want to perhaps um, dip into your Roth IRA if you have one. So this is a traditional approach. In practice, again, it can be entirely different. What I like to say, again, for some of my clients who are I refer to as young retirees, let's say someone decided to retire in their early 60s, so they have you know, seven, eight, maybe even 10 years up until they turn 73 and they have to take their required minimum distributions. Up until that point, it can actually be more beneficial for you, potentially at least, to take at least some fund funds out of your IRA because you're in such a low tax bracket. Okay, again, I, I'm not going to talk about this more mathematically. I'll just say that if you're a young retiree and you don't have to you know, take your RMDs out for some time, consider actually taking some funds out regardless because, you know, potentially in a lower tax bracket. Uh, what are the possible capital gains tax ramifications when selling a home after living there for many years? So couple versus single, a very, very typical question um, and usually comes up as part of as part of the seminar. So here's how it works. So let's say you bought a house for $100,000 uh, in Bethesda 30 years ago, which is a very, very common situation. Um, and let's say the house appreciated to $1 million as of today. Let's assume you're married and both of you are well, alive, right? If you decide to sell the home, the homeowner's exclusion of half a million dollars would apply because again, you're married. So then you would be paying taxes on the difference. So we start with the million, right? That's the sale price. We would then subtract what you paid for it originally, $100,000 in my example. You would sub subtract your homeowner's exclusion and it's half a million dollars if you or filing a joint tax return and for a single for a person it's 250,000. Then actually, if you've been keeping track of your home improvements, you can usually deduct those as well, but they have to be permanent in nature, okay? And then finally, when you're you know, selling your home, there would most likely be some um, selling costs. A lot of those are deductible as well. The bottom line here, in some sense, it works in both directions. Many, many times people underestimate how much they'll end up paying and you know, capital gain taxes when they sell their home or vice versa. I will just say this, this is not a complex calculation. In many cases, you can do it well enough yourself, but of course, if, if you're struggling, you're probably better off reaching out to someone so that you're not surprised by the tax time um, that you, let's say, owe a lot, of, a, a lot in taxes. Okay, then finally, in terms of you know what actions 
can you take, you know, now, well, again, given, given the context of our seminar today, I will say three things. Again, if you're transitioning already in retirement, and let's say there's some, you know, perhaps discomfort, you know, some uncertainty, you know, consider having a written plan in place. You know, it doesn't have to be this 27 or 50 page document that no one understands. A good, a solid plan can easily fit on one, maybe two sheets of paper. Uh, given how high the markets are, and I said the same thing in our previous seminar, I would, I would seriously consider, again, potentially taking some gains off the table, making sure that you have that bond buffer that we discussed earlier, that's very important. So keep that in mind. And then third, which in some sense, counter to what I said earlier, um, I recently had a client who transitioned to, to my firm. It's interesting how you know she, she used to work with someone for almost almost 10 years, and that, that was great. But then she started noticing that, again, her account's been underperforming so much because they're invested so conservatively. So keep that in mind, too. We are talking about protecting your portfolio, but you also want to benefit from strong markets. So that's, that's important, too. Jan? Anything you have to add? Uh, no, I, I fabulous advice. And I love the way you're able to explain things to people in a way that's easily understandable. I'm sure our audience appreciates that. Yes, yeah. I find it very digestible myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been I've been taking a lot of notes. <clears throat> yeah, great information. Um great so, that. uh it, Folks, feel free to either unmute yourself and ask a question, raise your hand, put your question in the chat. Uh, while you're thinking about that, um, I mentioned when we started the seminar that one of the main focuses of Capital Senior Solutions, other than selling your home when that time comes, is to provide education and advocacy for older adults and their families. So one of the other things we do is we host a free monthly downsizers club on Zoom. It's the first Friday of every month at 11 a.m. Um, the reason we're on Zoom is because we've grown to the point we have people all around the Beltway. So rather than make anybody travel, it's easiest to do it on Zoom. Um, it's a small support group that provides uh, resources for folks that are thinking about downsizing. Some don't know if they're moving or when they're moving. Some don't know where they're going. Some already know where they're going, but are waiting for a uh, room to become available in the community they've uh, they've waitlisted on or waiting for a new community to be built. But it's real a really fun support group where we share resources, challenges, successes. Um, I give homework every month and people report back on it. So it's really fun. And you can register at capitalseniorsolutions.com, which I just put in the chat window on the seminars page, where you'll also find a schedule of upcoming seminars on various topics. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And again, as, as perhaps people are thinking about their questions, please, please ask in the chat box and we'll be happy to address them for you. I'll just say two things. So we, we also do a lot of seminars and webinars and with, with Jan too. So please visit our website um, to, to see what we have coming up. Uh, we have a newsletter. It's every Wednesday at 7.30 a.m. that is dedicated to retirement planning. We don't only talk about retirement planning. We cover a variety of different topics, but they're connected. So if this is of interest, again, feel free to uh, visit our website to subscribe, or you can just send me an email and I'll subscribe you on my end. And also we offer complimentary strategy meetings, uh, you know, for those who are interested, and I'll emphasize the word strategy, um, for those of our, or perhaps potential clients, or again, if you're, if you're simply interested, if you have questions, we'll, we'll actually be happy to address them for you without providing any specific advice so that it's helpful to you. And again, I, I do a lot of seminars of this nature, and I very much understand that sometimes people want to ask questions, but they're private in nature. You know, finances are always private, so not everyone is comfortable. So again, that option is there. Send me an email or I have a Calendly for those of you who prefer to do this online. Again, happy, happy to help as much as possible. Well, what I don't see any questions so uh, so far anyway, so I think I'll turn it back over to Angelique. 
Yes. Um, thank you again, both for the wealth of information that you shared. My biggest takeaway was, you know, you need a written plan in place. And so it needs to be reviewed so that you can measure its performance and you have to implement it. So I'm feeling confident, <laughs> but I think that's, it, it's very important to consider. Um, so thank you again for your expertise. It's always a pleasure partnering with you both. Uh, yeah. We too have some upcoming um, events. We have one next month. Uh, I'll be partnering with Jan once again, and then Ellen Davis. And so we're really going to, Ellen is going to demystify long-term care insurance policies um, with the event, Life Happens, Are You Ready? So I will put the link here in the chat so that you can um, RSVP for that. And then we will, again, I'll make sure that everyone who's attended will receive the video um, for today's presentation. And so if there aren't any other questions, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye, thank everybody. You. Bye.